Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I'm the chair for the next session on multidisciplinary care, and we're going to carry on without a break. So if you need to disappear, please keep the noise to minimum and close the door behind you. So it gives me pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Peter Duke, who's one of our orthopedic surgeons here at Aspatar, with a particular interest in foot and ankle surgery. And his topic is going to be ankle and foot injuries in the Middle East. What are the challenges? Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Steve, for the nice introduction. I have no disclosures. And I would like to start, when we talk about challenges in ankle and foot athletes in the GCC, I would like to start saying that the evolution has been the one that Doha has known in the last 40 years, the last three to four decades. From a startup where, when we compare it with the ankle, we only talked about sprains and contusions. We nowadays talk about cartilage, about tendons, about ruptures of posterior capsules and all these things. Very exciting, a lot of development coming up. And we see that when we compare that to Doha, if you would take a uh, picture nowadays, it would be even double than what was there in 2013. Now, when we talk about challenges, we have to know the extent of the problem. And the extent comes through epidemiology. We have to know the figures before we know how to deal with them. And thanks to the, uh, for example, the epidemiology from the FIFA uh, World Cups, you can see over the last 18 years that the ankle has shown to be about 10%, 15%, 17%, and now 10% again of primary lesions, time loss injury lesions in these World Cups. Now, luckily, thanks to the data that we have from our ASPREF prevention uh, center here in Aspetar, and I have to recognize Dr. Erale, Bar, Karim Khan, Farouk, and Schumacher for the data that they gave uh, nicely to us, to have an idea to compare this football FIFA data with our data. They followed two years the QSL Star uh, League and they saw every injury and they noted it down. And we see that, for example, the ankle in trauma has 90%. So 90% in the last two years of the 168 uh, athletes we had with ankle trauma, 90% of them are traumatic. That's very important to realize. What about contact? We always compare with knee and thigh, the hamstring. What about contact? 64% uh, of the ankle are contact lesions. The others are non-contact. What about match and training? What is the extent of the problem? Interestingly, look at the ankle. We have 52.7% of match-related ankle injuries. Isn't that an amazing tool towards prevention? That means 47% of them occur in the training uh, environment. So that's where we, as, as a medical or paramedical person, can indulge in. We have to know that we can't really compare this data with the FIFA data because the methodology is different when we compare medical attention injuries and time loss injuries, but still, it gives us a good idea. Interestingly, 85% of the problems are sprains and contusions. We know that. Some of them are little, some of them are, are big, but 15% of them are not sprain-related, and that's where we have a focus. That's where we want to make a difference uh, in. Uh, in our team approach. I was always a forward in football in Belgium, and I had so many kicks on my ankle, but interestingly enough, you see that the forwards, only 10 to 13% of them gets uh, the ankle problems. Most of them are midfield, defensive midfield, and defense. So they give the kicks, they burn their ankles down. What about re-injury? About 10% of the ankles re-injure within these two years, which is very similar to the European and to the uh, worldwide data that is out there in football, for example. When we compare that with hamstrings and knees, it gives us a good correlation and it's interesting to see that although there are challenges, there are a lot of similarities also. The epidemiological data is pretty similar. So I was asked to talk about the challenges that we encounter. And I always say there's no such thing as a simple ankle sprain. We always think about the ankle, about the sprain. But it's not always a sprain. In 70% of cases, when you have a ligament sprain that is more than grade two, you have cartilage defects. Now, cartilage defects, they interfere with the career of the player. They are potentially career ending. So it's an impact, it's a contusion, it's a twist, it's a turn, it's a rotation. It's all different, but we call it an ankle injury. 
Well, I would say there's no such thing as an ankle sprain. There are many things involved, and if we don't encounter that, and if we don't see that or recognize it, we will get lost in our treatments also, especially when we talk about prevention further. So these are the challenges. Now, it's not always that difficult. This is a player that got tackled badly. You see that he has a Weber C fracture of the distal fibula, a big syndesmotic ligament rupture, and a deltoid ligament rupture. What do we do? We fix it. We put a plate, we realign the instability over the syndesmosis and the deltoid, and we get a good result. And this player comes back in three months. But aren't we pushing our athletes too much? We also have an ethical obligation because he came in last week and had to be admitted for a bucket handle tear. I go back a little, for a bucket handle tear of his medial meniscus. So we get them play fast and safe with great uh, muscles and, and, and great uh, loss of rigidity, so back to smoothness. But they do uh, go back and they have the heart to become the elite athlete again, and that's what happens. So I think we have a message there also. Unfortunately, it's not always like that. If you only treat the bone, my mentor always said, a fracture is a soft tissue injury where you happen to have broken bone. Well, if you don't encounter the ligaments, like the syndesmosis and the delta that was ruptured in this case also, you will have complications. This uh, athlete was uh, treated elsewhere, got back to his surgeon, and you can discuss about the choice of screws and whatever, but you cannot disregard that there's still an opening in the syndesmosis and the deltoid is not repaired, meaning you have a failure, the screws break, and this is potential career ending. These are the challenges that we encounter because we didn't respect the biology. We didn't respect the fact that the ligaments need to be realigned. It's all about biomechanics. Another story, what are the challenges? Um, in sports surgery, this is a jockey uh, working with one of the most famous horses in the world, and he fell down four weeks before he, uh, so he trained two years for a big competition, and four weeks before that competition, he fell down. He had this medial malleolar fracture. You would say, give him a cast, he'll be fine in two, three months, which is probably true, although in a watershed area like that, it's not always the case, because you have a diastasis in the joint, and you have this opening in a difficult to heal area of the ankle. The problem with this jockey is that in four weeks' time, he trained the last two years with his horse for one race. So he says, whatever happens, dog, I'm going to be there. And this is in his full final, four weeks after the surgery, because we went aggressive on it. We fixed it through arthroscopic uh, guided approach. And this is the guy, look at his left ankle, and he's reaching the line, and he won his tournament. So are we pushing the borders? Yes. But these athletes are doing that for themselves. That's why they're the elite athlete. Look at his left ankle in full final reaching the line. He's in full plantar force. He's kicking inside in adduction. He's really overloading that medial area, but the screws hold it. That's what we tend to do. So we talk about fractures, but there's also this new hot topic on impingement. We have the impingement of the cartilage, of the uh, tendons, of the soft tissue. And we see the impaction on all these areas. Now, we now know that through the arthroscopic development, I talked to you the last decade, how much it has been developed. By reaching all these areas, we can go minimal invasive, we can go safe and effective. And that's the beauty of it. We introduce the working portals, and with the arthroscope, we go really to the extent of the problem immediately. And you can have the bony impingement, you can have the soft tissue impingement, and luckily, through this arthroscopic approach, we can not only treat these classic lesions, but also the non-classic ones, like this one here. We have encountered a national team young player with a stress fracture in the tailor body, a difficult to treat entity. But when you use the arthroscopy, you go from the posterior side and you fix the fracture, you have this nice compression, and you can get that player easily and quicker back. When we treat recreational athletes, it's not always the same like the uh, professional athlete. We encounter so many different things in the elite athlete, like the ostrigonums that you see here on the medial side, they're normally lateral in the more safe zone. But what happens if they're just underneath the neurovascular bundle? If you open it, you need a very thorough and detailed surgical dissection with a lot of risk you take. If you use the arthroscope from the back, you just clean it up from the back side, you peel it off, and you can more safely remove this uh, pressure on the nerve and the bundles. And Thanks to development of these techniques, we see that we can reach the tailor cysts now. 
we can reach the osteodosteomas, we can reach the fibrous coalitions, we can reach the uh, calcaneal cysts and even stress fractures. So all these problems give the same type of clin clinical problem, but we can deal with it with the newer techniques. What about cartilage? Thanks to the great development of the cartilage center here by Dr. Landreau, Dr. Gelogli, and Dr. Britberg, the days that we only had microfracture are over. We have now the repair techniques, the car gel, the hylofast. We can really do an a la carte menu of these cartilage lesions. But we go even further. We push the borders with our shockwave therapy, our pulsed magnetic uh, therapy, and our stem cells. So everything is there. The repairs are doing well, but the athletes take time to come back. Maybe, and we're producing some literature on that, maybe by doing that, we can push the borders a bit further without disrespecting the biology and keeping it safe. It's not always about the cartilage itself. You need a good foundation. And there are so many cysts with these cartilage lesions that we have to deal with. Now with the arthroscope, we go underneath, we fill up the cysts, put bone inside, and create a good environment for that cartilage repair to come back. Unfortunately, there are still cases that fail. We got this uh, from a, a referral from Europe where this athlete was treated twice with microfracture, but keep, kept happen, having locking and difficulty to play and train. So what happened? I will go a bit further. We fixed it. We put two plugs from the knee with arthroscopy, put it in the ankle, and we fixed it through Oates procedure just to seal off that defect. Because if the microfracture can't do it, the biology is not respectful enough to get it done, this is with his right uh, ankle, how he plays after three and a half months. So all these things are surgical. But the big problem, if I humbly can say, is the screening, because that's where the magic comes in and the difficulty. I've encountered that personally. Uh, for example, in this case, this is a high exposure player that the club wants to sign. Big contract, and he was playing the last two years every day. I know Dr. Toll will recognize these pictures very well. Uh, there he is. Well, what happens? He has to sign for the contract. We screen him. What happens? We see some radiolucency on the medial side of both ankles. He recalls no specific problem. We go into depth. We take the MRI. Look on these injuries with edema and potential breakdown with loosening of the fragments. Shall we sign this player? Are we sure that he will play the next three seasons? We're not. These are the challenges that we encounter. And it's no, not always a yes or no answer. Another case, we have microfracture on a Don elsewhere in an, uh, in an uh, elite national team player on the medial side. But did we, as medical professionals, not disregard the problem? The problem is the virus, is the alignment. So he is overloading his medial side. That's why he gets the cartilage lesion. And if you go further, you start to see stress risers there. And if you go further, it goes up and up and up. And eventually, it leads to a full medial stress fracture. Did we disregard the biology? Yes. We disregarded the alignment. We just treated the cartilage lesion. So what do we do? We fix it with arthroscopic guided approach. And the most important, we realign it thanks to our podiatrist. And he's playing back. So are these challenges purely surgical? Certainly not. And then we had talks in the, the States recently with the guys who treat the NFL and NHL and NBA players. And they say, if I have a stress fracture or a fracture, I want my CT normal. But that's a challenge, because if you look, you can have a CT scan positive up to six years after a stress fracture. You can't keep the athlete six years off. When it's clinical, you have it in a few weeks. The MRI comes back to normal in a few months, and the bone scan one to two years. On what will we rely to tell our patient, to tell our athlete, you're back? We know from data from Karim Khan and Bruckner, and from uh, Exrand and uh, Van Dijk, that it has to be individually tailored. And the vicular fractures do better with cast. Uh, metatarsal five fractures do better uh, with surgery. But not always like that. It can fail also even if you do surgery. If you, don't dis if you disregard the biology, your screw is not in the right position, your impaction is not there, you will have a failure. And then you see, where are we now? Then we have to go back to the literature from Professor Popovich uh, that he published in the 70s, where he said, you have to put a bone graft in. Wasn't done, and finally with the bone graft and respecting biology, it works. My mentor always said, if the surgeon does something logic, biology does the rest. And I think these signs are there. And these are the challenges that we face, but we have to respect uh, the findings. A few words on the tendon. We talked about fracture, about impingement. But what about tendons? 
We have all these athletes with these nodular tendinopathies where the physios struggle with their eccentric tra uh, training. We know, now know that the plantaris tendon adhes adheres on the Achilles tendon. And if you don't release them and innervate, they remain having problems. And with these minimal invasive techniques, we get there. Unfortunately, it's not always like that. This was on the Doha International uh, World Cups of Athletics. The World Cup champion in 2013 of, uh, of triple salt uh, gets a full Achilles tendon rupture uh, with retraction of more than four centimeters. So we open it up, we fix it. And these are the challenges that we face. What do we do? We fix it quickly, we put everything inside to make it work, the specific sports surgical sutures, and then uh, I don't want to disregard the huge amount of uh, plus that comes from our physio. So with Alter G and with the water training and all this functional rehab, you can really bring your athletes quicker back, not quicker for biology, but quicker regarding less rigidity and more muscle trophic status. And this is what the coach sent us. Look, it's his, uh, it's his left foot. This is after three months. I know we're pushing the boundaries here, but this guy is training for Rio. That's his dream. That's what he wants to do. This is after five months. So he's working on it. And believe it or not, eight months now down the line, he became champion of France again. So this team approach, podiatry, physio, nutrition, surgery, uh, I'm sure I forgot some, but this is what makes the difference in our athletes. My last word goes to the ligament. We've talked about that there's no such thing as a simple ankle sprain. Well, I think it's very clear, and the literature that we produce here shows that, that in more than 50 up to 70%, there are combined lesions that need our focus for the long-term strategies. And don't forget that there is something like a functional instability. The athlete feels unstable, but the most important is our clinical examination where we can really find out these mechanical instabilities. I want to show you what is the future. I think the future is two words, communication and collaboration. Communication by communicating well with our teams of ISACOS and ESCA and the world of sports to say what we see, to combine these experiences and learn from each other. And then the collaboration, together with that communication, for example, we recently, with our teams in Aspitar, we helped in the development of the football team physician diploma that will be necessary to attend official FIFA tournaments, where we developed the ankle and foot module. So it's a free access, and I highly uh, uh, invite you to look at the, the website to see where you can help your team physicians and your paramedics to indulge in these strategies. And just to say that if your athlete, after the surgery, tattoos a smiley on the posteromedial side of its ankle, it means we as a team did a good job. We are Aspetar. Thank you very much.